to the Peer Meet the Students podcast, where every month we showcase a student or researcher from the Peer Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center community. My name is Crystal. I'm here with Brian, and we're both from the Peer Student Committee. And today we are joined by Francisco Galvez. Francisco Galvez is a Colombian structural engineer currently pursuing a PhD at the Stanford University. His research aims to leverage high fidelity structural modeling to inform policy decisions regarding disaster risk management with a special focus on earthquake engineering. Before starting his PhD in 2017, Francisco served for two years as a full-time le lecturer in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Universidad de los Andes, one of the top universities in Colombia. He also has four years of consulting experience in the structural design of large projects. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. We're going to start out with a fun, somewhat random question. If graduate school were a food, what food do you think it would be and why? I say, at least for the PhD part, uh, I think it would be something you know, bittersweet a little bit. I think, you know, like a passion fruit, something like that, at the beginning mm -hmm. is kind of bitter, but then it turns to be sweet. You just face these problems that that are unexplored ground, and, and then you come up with a bunch of ideas, you try 10 or 20 of them, and none of them work. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty bitter, until one works, and that's really sweet. In Colombia, we have this, this fruit we call lulo, which is kind of like that, too. It's my favorite fruit, by the way. Great. So thank you, Francisco, for answering our fun question. Now let's get <laughs> to know more about your academic career. What made you interested in earthquake engineering? There are a few things. The first one is that Colombia is a very earthquake active country. So we have at least two or three earthquakes every year that we actually feel. I grew up in a, in a, sm in a smaller city. It's called Ibagué. When I was like nine years old, um, in a nearby town, where actually my wife is from, there was a huge earthquake and, and that nearly destroyed that city. But it was really strong. Like, you know, you have to evacuate the house and run around. Oof. So, so it, was, it was very shocking to see how, you know, how, you know, how that could happen. And you just don't know. And then moving on, then my dad's a civil engineer in pavements and like building roads. So mm -hmm. I, often I will just go with him during my high school vacations and, and just shadowing him. And, and I think that's why I got interested in civil engineering, not particularly in, in structural and in earthquakes. But then when I started school, kind of the, the memories came back. And as I was saying, you know, every year you feel two or three. And then, you know, you're in a building and then start shaking and then you're studying that at school. <laughs> so, it, it, uh, so yeah, so I think that uh, that's part of the reason why I, I, I got interested in earthquake engineering, that clear presence of earthquakes often, thankfully not this, you know, as destructive as of that one, that was 99, but, uh, you know, it could happen. What are your research goals? Research is the chance when we get to address different solutions, maybe without the clear reason or, or the clear light that we're going to get somewhere but we just have the time to, to pursue ideas on, on that direction. So that's why I end up trying to do a PhD, try to have the time to think through more thoroughly of problems and solutions to those problems. But then concretely now, what I hope really is that my research help make decisions, for example, uh, building codes, which I think is a direct way when we as engineers can impact the way society grows. But then also in general policy making, this bill going on um, at, the, at the state level for, for recovery from earthquakes. Research can inform uh, policy and other stakeholders to make those decisions. I try to do whatever work or research that can help make those decisions in, in the right direction. And then now if we go narrower a little bit more on my particular research, you know, I'm, I'm thinking on, on, on what are the effects of these all uh, vulnerable steel buildings that are widespread across the United States, the so-called pre notridge frames. What's the risk that these buildings pose to society, especially in dense urban areas where you have a bunch of these buildings and they are also very tall and not only could affect build people's safety, but also the recovery and the economic activity of that region. So I'm trying to quantify you know, with the structural engineering rigor what might be those consequences so that the stakeholders can have data to make decisions of like, should we issue a mandate? Should we finance some retrofit activities? Or should we come up with some financing alternative for in the case of an earthquake, this can uh, be repaired fast or, or insurance or you know things like this that can really help down the line. 
Can you give us an idea of like how common those pre Northridge buildings are? In downtown area, downtown San Francisco, which is the area of my main focus, mm-hmm. uh, the buildings that are taller than 160 feet, so the the, the, the skyscrapers, you'll say, mm-hmm. uh, are around roughly 180. Yeah. From those, half are pre Northridge moment frames. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty significant. There's, there's a lot to do, right? Yeah, and and this is not only counting the the shorter one. This was the the prefer by far structural system for buildings mm-hmm. between the early 1900s until Northridge. Mm-hmm. It was almost 100 years when everyone was like, oh, still buildings are the best. They are earthquake proof. Yeah. Like truly that was thought, right? Yeah. And then Northridge came and it's like, mm-hmm. not enough. Yeah. But they're too expensive and too many. So we just live with them. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you tell us about your journey as an international student? You know, after being here now nearly 40 years now, I came to realize that there are many obstacles that we put ourselves. So like this, I put on myself. I didn't dare to try earlier, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. to come here. I graduated and I did a master's back home and worked for a few years and then teach. And then I applied to come here. At the time, I was thinking, well, no, no, to go to this university, you know, you need to have you know, this, this big portfolio of things. Now being here, I realized that that it's just hard work, really. And if you're willing to do hard work, it's just just try it and apply, and you know, leave you know the ap- application committee decide. And you know, I think I should have uh, tried earlier, maybe. Um, yeah. I was super fortunate to come to Stanford. It's just like. Phew, so much fun to be here so cool it's unbelievable still and everyone is just so understanding and so open to be in an environment with so much diversity i love it i i've learned a lot also of like talking with people from really different backgrounds that i would really you know would have met if i just stay in my country we've mentioned this briefly but you've had a fair amount of experience in structural engineering both in academia and in industry so can you tell us about your path and what are your current career goals? I did my undergraduate in Colombia. I moved from my hometown to the big city, to Bogota, to do the undergrad there. So I did a thesis measurement the vibrations of a bridge. The company that designed that bridge offered me a job. So then I started working with them. It was really fun. I worked with them almost 40 years. And it was perfect timing because Colombia was starting to develop a bunch of of highway projects. I did my master's at the same time. When I finished, there was a chance to become a full-time lecturer. And the professors that I took classes with in the master's was like, oh, apply. So I was like, okay, apply, see what happens. And then they offered me the job. And that's when I really had to think what to do because I was really happy at, at, at the company when I was designing bridges. Like I even got the chance to work in the design of a, of a cable stay bridge, mm-hmm. which is an amazing project for a 25 year old. But then it was also the question of the PhD. Like, do I really want to do a PhD you know, going abroad? So I was like, okay, so, so let's try the PhD. So I went to the university, quit my industry job and went there and you know, teach and at the same time, prepare paperwork for all the scholarships and things. And that's how I ended up here, pursuing the PhD. And now, uh, what to do next is a good question. So I'm working very hard um, to uh, graduate next year. So that's the first thing. But then down the line, I think I would like to go back to industry. I really had a lot of fun when I when I was in industry back in Colombia. I would like to have similar experience now in the U.S. And, and now that I've seen more problems that we can tackle with what we do. Right, like risk assessment and how we can also tackle problems that go beyond like structural response and having conversations with uh, city planners and I don't know, maybe insurance companies that also manage this risk and, and, and are, do rigorous analysis. So I think that's sort of where I'm heading, but it's still very up in the air yet. Can you tell us about any achievement which you are especially proud of? Ooh. Probably the bridge you were mentioning first. Yeah, yeah. That's the first <laughs> one that comes to mind. Yeah, they are working on that bridge was amazing. So, so to give you a, bit, a little bit of context, uh, the largest river in Colombia is called Rio Magdalena. It like cuts through the middle of the country. And there are a, a number of bridges that cross it that they are all too narrow. So one of the big highway projects that, that started like eight years ago was to make a bigger highway that crosses to there. And, and one of the solutions was a bridge. So when I joined this company, they, they were already pushing this and evaluating different options until there was approved to design this cable state bridge. But the boss of the company, kind of one of the partners in the company, was kind of leading the whole conceptual part of the project. But then there was another engineer who was also like a 
15 years of experience that was going to do the actual design. And then we've been working for like two or three years, like two and a half years. He was mentoring me basically. And then he requested me for the project. So I was very lucky. And it was basically the three of us just, just doing this massive project. Of course, we had uh, people doing the, the drawings, the detailed drawings and everything. But they were three engineers and I was one of them. And I was in charge of doing the, the village modeling and all of these cool parts. So it was, it was really, really amazing. And I haven't had the chance to see it in person. Like they had a YouTube channel. So the, the construction began like two months before I came to the U.S., so I was following you know, every month, like what's the uh, construction progress and everything. I was so cool. Like to a see. baby monitor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is still pending to cross that bridge. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I haven't yet. That, I'll have to do it very soon. Finally, we'd like to wrap up with a favorite, fun, but informative question of ours. If you had to explain your research to a five-year-old, what would you say? I think I'll, I'll try to draw like an analogy and make it kind of a game. Like take these um, paper clips, they have mm -hmm. a few and then say, okay, let's, let's do a, like a competition or something like that. And they say, or in, in one minute, how many paper clips, you know, bending them back and forth can, can each of us break in one minute or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then start doing it. And then I'll try to draw an analogy and say, you know, the, the clip is a uh, steel building and your hands are the earth that shakes from one to time. Mm -hmm. and, and if it shakes enough times, the, the, the clip can break just like the, building can break and and I think I'll, I'll try to do something like that and then say you know what I do is you know go to cities which are basically boxes of clips like this one and try to simulate when will this those things will break you know instead of breaking them in reality because that would be very bad we That's try right. to simulate it in the computer Francisco thank you so much for joining us today we had a wonderful time learning more about you and your work and before we go If our viewers and listeners have any questions for you, how can they get in touch with you? Oh, yes. Uh, no, I'd be, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to anyone. Uh, they can write me an email, for They'll example. put it on the or screen. Or LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, whichever. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me also. Uh, thank really. you so much. Sure. It was a pleasure uh, listening to you and getting your experience. This concludes our July 2021 Spotlight for the Meet the Peer Student Series. See you in the next one.